We are in the last few chapters of Isaiah, and it might be helpful for us as we take up our study again at the beginning of a new session to set these chapters that we are going to be studying between now probably and near Christmas in their context. Of course, the whole of Isaiah, as you will know, covers a period of two centuries, from the middle of the 8th century B.C. right into the middle of the 6th century B.C. Sometimes people have said there are two centuries that Isaiah covers, and obviously it is also composed in two sections. There are two great parts of the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 1 to 39 and chapter 40 to 66. And it is not difficult either to discern two great themes. God's warning of judgment, which is the great theme of chapters 1 to 39, and his promise of salvation, which is the great theme of chapters 40 to 66. But it's also true to say that these two centuries are united by one prophetic voice addressing the whole of this period. And although we see 200 years spanned by the prophecy of Isaiah, it is one voice and that the prophet addressing his own contemporaries first of all and addressing the whole nation and telling them of the seriousness with which God views their sin and the prospect of exile in the land of Babylon. And then the same Isaiah addresses the people of God in bondage in Babylon and as they are brought back out of Babylon in the second great exodus, as it were, where the people of God are restored from exile back to Jerusalem, back to Zion. And the two centuries are therefore uh, united by this one voice. And the two sections of Isaiah are therefore united by a common author whom we believe to be Isaiah of Jerusalem, one of the four great 8th century prophets. And the two great themes are united also by one theme. It is not just that we have two themes of the uh, warnings of God about judgment and the promises of God about salvation, there is one overarching theme of the prophecy of Isaiah, and that is the theme of the character of God in his holiness and sovereignty. You remember how that theme is stamped upon our minds at the beginning of the prophecy, probably at the beginning of Isaiah's ministry in chapter 6, where he sees the Lord high and lifted up, enthroned in the temple, and his train filled it. And the cry of the seraphim was, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the phrase, the Holy One of Israel, recurs 26 times in the prophecy of Isaiah. Interestingly enough, for those who would want to make the second part of Isaiah written by somebody else, the Holy One of Israel occurs 13 times in chapters 1 to 39 and 13 times in chapters 40 to 66. It's one of the unifying stylistic features of the prophecy of Isaiah. So God's holiness and sovereignty reveals itself in judgment in chapters 1 to 39, and it reveals itself in salvation in chapters 40 to 66. Now, at chapter 61, we are in the section of Isaiah where it appears the exiles have been brought back, back probably to Jerusalem, and God is speaking to them through Isaiah about the true glory 
of his salvation, which will come to its ultimate fulfillment in the servant of Jehovah who is pictured for us in these four servant songs that we studied last year. Uh, Chapter 42, 49, 50, and 53, these are the four places where you find this figure who tends to dominate the second half of Isaiah, who is the key to God's provision of salvation, the fulfillment of all the promises that he makes about coming in redeeming grace to his people. And that figure of the servant of Jehovah, of course, as he emerges, is so clearly and obviously the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus frequently quotes from such passages as we read in these servant songs and says that Isaiah speaks of me. Now here in chapter 61, interestingly enough, many people have asked, is this a place where we have a fifth servant song? Because the language and some of the content of this is very like the language of some of the other servant songs in Isaiah. For example, if you look back to chapter 42, you'll see that there at the beginning, in the first of the servant songs, we read something that would make you think of this particular chapter 61. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Many people have thought that here in chapter 61 we have another of these servant songs where the servant is the figure who is saying again, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. However that may be, there is no question that this part of chapter 61 is certainly messianic in the sense that it is pointing forward to the coming of the Messiah, which is just the anointed one. That's what the word Messiah means, as you will know. And he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me. And it refers ultimately and certainly has its ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. We needn't speculate about that or question it, because Jesus has settled the matter for us beyond question in Luke chapter 4, when he takes the scroll of Isaiah and stands up in the synagogue and reads it, and then sits down as the teacher and says, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now he is saying it just immediately after there has been this remarkable opening of heaven and the Holy Spirit has come down upon him and anointed him for his task as the Savior of God's people very significant thing how you see both here in Isaiah and there at the anointing of Jesus after his baptism, uh, this almost casual reference to the Trinity. Have you noticed? You don't really get arguments about the Trinity in Scripture. What you get are sometimes almost casual references to it, evidences, displays of the triunity of the Godhead. Here you have the Spirit of God. And He is described as the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. And, says the Messiah, He is on me because the Lord has anointed me. So you have the figure of Jehovah, the Sovereign Lord, 
You have the Son of God, of whom God the Father says at his anointing, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And you have the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, coming down upon the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4. You get this display, therefore, of the three-personed Godhead here in Isaiah 61 and in Luke 4. And Jesus says, this scripture is today fulfilled in your ears. Now, that of course is not to say that there is not a fulfillment of the scripture for the people whom Isaiah was addressing. That is, the exiles who have returned to Zion. And whether he was addressing them there or addressing them in Babylon and bringing them the promise of God's rich grace when he brought them back to Jerusalem doesn't really matter. The important thing is that there is a fulfillment, first of all, in the release of the people of God from Babylon. But its deeper fulfillment is not a physical one. And this is a really important principle. The deeper fulfillment of this promise is the spiritual fulfillment in the salvation that God has brought in the one who is the fulfillment of the servant figure, the servant par excellence, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. I am come not to be served, but to serve, he says. He was willing to be made a servant and humbled himself to that end. Now, it is in him and in the spiritual blessings the gospel brings in Christ that the ultimate fulfillment of these promises is to be found. Who then is speaking in verse 1 of chapter 61? Of course, in an initial sense, it will be the prophet Isaiah, who, as were all the prophets, is anointed for his ministry. You will remember there were three figures in the Old Testament who were anointed by God for their ministry. One was the prophet, the second was the priest, and the third was the king. Examples of the prophet and the priest being anointed by God are in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 16. Um, let me just read it to you. Uh, from verse 15, the Lord said to Elijah, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from abel to succeed you as prophet. Well, there are two cases of anointing. First, one as king, and the other as prophet. And for an instance of one being anointed as priest, uh, you need to look at Exodus 28:41, for example. But these three figures were anointed with oil, most probably, to seal their calling by God and to signify that God had poured out his anointing approval and his spirit upon them. And Jesus is anointed in that sense, in Luke 3, 21, after his baptism, as all three. He is the one who is anointed as prophet, and so he says, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He is anointed as priest, because he is to be the fulfillment of all that the priesthood stood for, he will be the one who will not only mediate between God and men and offer sacrifices for the removal of sin, he will do that effectually by becoming the sacrifice as well as the priest himself. So he is anointed to be our priest, and he is anointed 
to be the king of all creation. Now, to the first hearers of this prophecy, its fulfillment would be literal and physical as the exile in Babylon is literal and physical. But the fullest application of them, it's important for us to recognize, was equally undoubtedly spiritual. Look at what these blessings were. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from, from the prisoners. Now, of course there was a physical fulfillment of that for those who were sitting in Babylon in poverty and broken-hearted like those who sang the psalm by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Now God is bringing to them the message of gospel hope when he says, he is sending me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to take those who are captives and proclaim liberty for them, and release from darkness those who are prisoners in the bondage of Babylon. That's a picture of the physical condition in which they live. But there is a grave misunderstanding of this promise in Isaiah 61 which makes many people say, this is why Jesus has come. Now this is something that's reflected, for example, in what you may hear called liberation theology from South America. The idea that what the gospel promises to people is to feed the poor and to liberate the captive and to deliver those who are in prison. And that is what will happen when the gospel is made real in a community, they will say. Now, there is no question whatsoever that the grace of God and the gospel touches the hearts of men and women and changes them in such a way that they do begin to minister to the poor as the whole history of social revolution in this country bears witness to, and that there is a concern to liberate people from all manner of bondage. But the terrible tragedy, you see, of merely applying this gospel promise to physical conditions is that we lose the real impact of the gospel because the thing the gospel does is infinitely greater and infinitely bigger than this. And it is the thing that Jesus was speaking of when he speaks of the blessedness that the Beatitudes describe and which the gospel brings in his coming. And these gospel blessings are riches for the poor in spirit. The binding up of the broken heart that is mourning because of sin. The liberation from the bondage of sin that those who are in that bondage desperately need. And the freedom out of the prison house of Satan that only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring to people. Now, it's enormously important for us to grasp this, because this is the gospel. My dear friends, the fruits of the gospel are all the activities that God's people will engage in to minister to the poor, to bind up the broken-hearted who are broken-hearted because of the effects of being in a fallen world, to deliver those who are unjustly imprisoned, and so on and so on. These are the fruits of the gospel, and they ought to appear in our lives. 
I mean, Christian people above everybody else ought to be concerned about injustice in society and about the state and condition of the poor and about those who are in physical bondage of many different kinds. But the primary thing that the gospel touches is the spiritual condition of God's people and draws them out of the place where they are in poverty and mourning, broken-hearted over their sin. He binds them up. He brings good news to the poor. He proclaims liberty to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Notice what this refers to. And Jesus' quotation of this passage ends with the first sentence of verse 2. Did you notice that as we read it in Luke 4? It ends with the first sentence. He does not go on to the day of vengeance of our God. But the coming of the Messiah, you see, is the inauguration of a day of grace. That's what he's saying. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, many people think, that that is a reference back to the year of Jubilee of which the Old Testament spoke, a year when captives were allowed to go free, and I think that's probably true. But that itself is a shadow of the glorious reality that comes in the day of, in the year of grace, which the Messiah is here speaking of when he speaks of the year of the Lord's favor. And the point about the year of the Lord's favor, that is the present day of grace in which we live, is that it will come to a conclusion on the day of vengeance. Now, I think that's what this particular prophecy is speaking about. It is telling us about a year of the Lord's favor, concluding in a day of vengeance to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, many scholars think that the reason Jesus stopped after the first sentence was that he was inaugurating the season of grace and that the day of vengeance would only come not at his first coming, but at his second coming. We are living in a day of grace here and now. So there is a proclamation that the Messiah makes. And it's a very interesting thing that our Lord's first ministry, which he articulately says is why he has come into the world, was proclamation. Very interesting thing to notice, Jesus was first and foremost a preacher when he came. Now, that is not to say that Jesus' whole ministry was that of preaching. I think it's James Denny who used to teach theology in a somewhat better day in Glasgow uh, theological faculty. James Denny once said, Jesus did not come to preach the gospel. Jesus came that there might be a gospel to preach. Now, that's a very, uh, what the Americans would call a very insightful thing to say, Steve, isn't it? But um, that is true. But it is also true that there is a pattern from which to learn from the ministry of Jesus that Jesus came to be a preacher and teacher. God anointed him to be a prophet. And when people urged him to come into some other place, he said, I must go and teach and preach the message of the kingdom, for this is why I came forth. And it's a very interesting thing to study in the Gospels, the teaching and preaching ministry of Jesus. This was his primary ministry during these years. Sometimes he took small companies of people like these 12 men with whom he spent the greater bulk of three years. But publicly and more privately, his ministry was a ministry of preaching and teaching and proclamation. 
But you will notice the other uh, side of this. He came not only that, there, that he might preach and teach, but that he might provide. And you will notice there is a proclamation uh, that the poor will find riches in Christ, that the brokenhearted will find their wounds bound up in Christ, that the captives will find liberty and the prisoners release, uh, that the Lord has come to usher in a year of his favor or grace. But the other element in his coming is to make provision for a new creation which will display God's glory. Do you notice that in verses, in verse 3 particularly? And to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Now, do you notice this new creation? And this is the new creation of taking away what was there because of sin and bringing upon them the marks of grace. The marks of sin are being taken away and the marks of grace are given to them. Provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Now, you will know that ashes, uh, particularly related in the Old Testament to mourning, people who were mourning covered themselves often in ashes. Um, It's something that you find again and again uh, in Scripture. It was an outward mark of mourning, particularly mourning over a sense of the judgment of God and the despair that that had brought upon them. And here is this mark of mourning. It is going to be taken away and replaced by a crown of beauty, the oil of gladness instead of the mourning which came from such a heart and a garment you will know that in days of joy uh, Old Testament people uh, anointed themselves with olive oil a very peculiar thing to do I think uh, I, I, I can't imagine that it's something many of us would uh, want to do but it was a mark of rejoicing that they anointed themselves with olive oil And that's what this reference is to, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now you will know the spirit of despair. It's the very thing that marked the people of God in Babylon. You know, they chided them and said, sing us one of the Lord's songs. We hanged our harps on the willows, they said. And when they said to us, sing us one of the songs of Zion, they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They were cast down in spirit. They were surrounded by the evidence of the disciplines of God on their lives lives and the judgment of God on their nation. And they had no song in their hearts. But notice what God is going to do. He is going to give them a garment of praise. I think that really means to clothe them with the praises of God in place of a spirit of despair. Now let me just point out to you for the time is going on. It goes faster here actually than most other places you may notice. But Just let me point out to you, my dear friends, one of the signs of the people of God when the Spirit of God through the Son of God begins to work in their lives, one of the signs is that they become troubled over their sin. Do you notice that? They become troubled over their sin. One of the problems with the people to whom Isaiah addresses himself in the early part of Isaiah is that they have no problem about their sins. They regard them casually, you see. 
Now, have you ever wondered why Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn. He's not talking about physical mourning, because you will know that mourning by itself is not a blessed experience. Mourning can often lead people, and I've watched them again and again, it can lead them into bitterness instead of blessing very easily. But spiritual mourning, that is mourning over sin, over the poverty that I've seen in my own heart in the presence of God, that sense of despair over myself and my sin that brings me a real spirit of mourning. That's one of the first signs of hope. Because God comes to such a soul and brings them this glorious provision for those who grieve in Zion. Notice how often it's repeated. A crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I thought of this so much. A little while ago, when I visited somebody who asked to see me about a certain situation that they were in, I went wanting so much to comfort them because of their failure and to pour the oil of God into the wounds that I thought would be there in their heart. I wanted greatly to bring to them the glad tidings of a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. You know the problem I found. There was absolutely no spirit of heaviness. There was absolutely no sense of any kind of sorrow over sin. There was a lot of sorrow about its consequences, but not over sin itself. And when God is coming to his people, he has done a thorough work in their souls. He has brought them here to discover the real nature of sin and to see this reality of mourning and grieving over it. And then he brings them the garment of praise for a spirit of despair, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the crown of beauty instead of ashes. And do you see what he is aiming at? He wants to make them solid trees bearing the fruit of the glory of God in their lives with their roots going down into his character. And so he says they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. What a text to preach on. Oaks of righteousness. That's the description God gives of the people he has in view. Not little weedy, half-alive branches that are stuck in the ground and blown down by the first breeze but oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord and displaying His glory. Oh, my dear friends, one such oak is worth a hundred Little weedy plants that scarcely show any sign of life at all. And it is when God does this amazing and glorious work of grace in their lives 
that he produces amongst his people oaks of righteousness. I have to confess to you, I didn't know where the phrase came from at that time. But I remember William Fitch, who was my minister in Springburn Hill Church when I was a student, used to um, invite some of us to the manse, and there we prayed together. And I remember him pleading with God and crying to him, Lord, in this place... What we want to see is oaks of righteousness planted by your own hand, bearing your glory. And that is what I believe God is saying to us here in Isaiah 61 that he wants wherever there is a company of his people who have known the day of his grace and the power of his spirit that they will become oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Well, that's enough for us for one evening, isn't it? And enough for a long time. And by God's grace, we need to see him translate that promise into reality in us. Let's pray together. Our blessed Lord, we bow before you. We marvel at the day of grace that has dawned in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the privilege of living in an age of grace, we bless you. O God, we pray that we may so be wrought upon by your word and spirit that we may become oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord, displaying your glory. To this end, bless us, we pray, and write your word upon our hearts, and let great glory and honor come to your name. For we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.